669301. This is Johnson's copy scanned from the hard copy print, which he loaned me back in 1995 when we first met. And I had access to his archive in his home, apart from a lot more film that he sent to the university or took to the university uh, up in, uh, in Oklahoma City. Um, this print alone blew my mind because it confirmed from untouched original source data preserved from low-level generational copies of the film. With film, which are analog mechanisms, the more copies you make, the worse the quality gets. A copy of a copy of a copy of a copy is awful. With digital, a copy of a copy of a copy is exactly the same because it's binary. It's ones and zeros, ones and zeros, and they can't bounce up ones and zeros. However, with film, you want the lowest generation possible to make prints, to make transparencies, to make something that you can look at and analyze. And fortunately, Ken had the most pristine, lowest generational number version of this data that we know of anywhere on the planet right now. So I, when he gave me these prints, I took them back, 1995 now. Think of the scanner technology then compared to now. And we scanned the film and we discovered something absolutely extraordinary. I mean, mind-blowing extraordinary. This is a close-up. We see the hills. We see just hints that something is not quite right in the sky. And when you scan it and simply turn up the gain, turn up the brightness, there, all over the sky, is a stunning set of geometry. Glass-like, semi-transparent, scattering geometry, scattering blue light, which tells us that it must be fine particles, fine stuff, very micron size, with various imperfections, holes, sparkles, the whole nine yards. This is what can caught them painting out in the LRL, because everyone knows you can't see stars from the moon. The bright things were not stars. They were shining bits of glass scattering sunlight recorded by these primitive, by today's standards, Hasselblad cameras on 35 millimeter ectochrome film. Now, it was a special ectochrome. We don't have time this morning to get into all that story that NASA actually secretly developed a special film to go to the moon. That's a whole other saga, and there's going to be more chapters in this saga, so we may invite you back in the next few weeks or months and do a part two, because this is a huge story, and we can't do justice in an hour, hour and a half, or whatever. Starting with this image, we then did sectionals, and we found that as you zoomed in, you got more and more detail in this supposedly black sky above the moon. Remember, it's a vacuum, no atmosphere. There should be nothing here. It should be pitch black. That, again, is why they were painting it out. This all fits together awfully, awfully well, and I use the term awfully with full knowledge. If you look carefully at this section, you'll see now that there is a stunning three-dimensional girder-like geometry, a scaffolding, rebar, a structural matrix standing above the moon anchored to the surface by a set of slanted buttresses. The geometry is perfect, meaning it absolutely is consistent with what constructional techniques would be there if you had built something miles high above the current surface of the moon. If you look in close up, you'll see in the buttresses there are layers of detail. This again is what to me stunning, amazing, stunning quality because we had not had access to anything approaching this low generation from the Apollo negatives. In ordering all our stuff through the National Space Science Data Center, through Johnson in, in Houston, through the Lunar Planetary Laboratory, which is one of the Johnson affiliates, we had looked at things that were hinting that this kind of detail was there. But Ken Johnston was an incredible ray of sunshine because here he had 30-year-old, perfectly preserved, low-generation copies of NASA's priceless original film. And all over this film, we saw astonishing evidence of architecture on the moon that did not belong there. The reason I have a close-up now of a helmet is because each astronaut wore a gold visor, a gold-covered faceplate over the 
Lexon faceplate of the space helmet, which kept the air in and kept the astronaut from dying from explosive decompression. All these years, we have been told by NASA that, oh, this space plate is designed to protect them from sunburn, from ultraviolet, from being burned. Well, I, along with everybody else, took NASA's word and never did my homework. When we got into this, when I started looking at how, how was NASA set up to know what they were going to photograph, how, if you're an astronaut in a spacesuit, do you know where to click the camera with your body to show the ruins? You've got to be able to see them to take the picture of what's there. So when I ran the curves, it turned out that based on this panorama, which is, by the way, the frame I'm talking about, uh, 9301, is this one right here, um, you've got this wavelength dependence of the human vision, you put the helmet on, and lo and behold, the helmet suppressed all of the spectrum, except for the blue-violet part, which is 20 times brighter now, which means NASA outfitted every astronaut who walked on the moon with a helmet with a glass film over it, which allowed them to see the ruins with the unaided human eye and take pictures of what was there. And all these years, they have been lying to us about the reason for the gold-covered helmets. When you enhance the panorama, Ken actually had an 8x10, which was a composite in the lab of all of the individual frames that Shepard took. Click, 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 click. If you look at the entire sky above the lunar landscape, there were stunning ruins all over the horizon, 360 around. This is the shadow of Shepard, all right? We brighten this up. The ruins are blue. They're scattering blue light, kind of similar to why the sky is blue on Earth, because it's, it's fine particle scattering. It's not uniform, however. You can see that as you pan around the horizon, the 360, it changes with azimuth. In other words, if you look at this set of stuff, this crud in the sky, it somehow knows where the sun is. The scattering is dependent on sun angle, which something simply, some imperfection with the film, you know, or some bad chemistry or something that went wrong in the lab would have no way of knowing. This panorama shows clearly that the scattering is dependent on sun angle. It is brightest down sun, which means it's acting like, like, like a movie screen. It's scattering the sun light through the ruins back at you, and that's why it's brightest where the shadow is of Shepard pointing away from the sun. Everything about this scattering is consistent with it being a real physical set of lunar ruins extending miles above the moon, made of meteor battered smashed glass over countless millions of years. So it's the consistency of cigarette smoke. It's in a vacuum, it's in lunar gravity, there's no wind, no air, it just sits there until something comes through like a meteor or a spacecraft, and then it's brushed aside, but looking through miles and miles and miles of it, you know, hundreds of miles.